Hey there, it's finally 2022, and you know what they say, new year, new me. So this year, I'm gonna be a prick. And what better way to do that than bitch about video games? No. Talking shit about anything and everything gaming on the internet seems to be a surefire way to rile up anyone, regardless of how tame and insignificant it may seem. What do you mean you think Gex is only a 7 out of 10, you fucking degenerate? Gamers are a passionate bunch, and sometimes it's understandable. I mean, I'm getting pissed off just looking at this thing. In reality though, given how varied the medium is, it's completely reasonable to expect a variety of different opinions on things. But it's when someone shares an opinion that goes against the general consensus, now that's when it gets spicy. Even if some reactions to those views can be just a tad extreme. I believe this game to be subpar. <sighs> well now I'm gonna kill you and your family. It is however the more hot takes, so to speak, that we are drawn to the most. Like vultures on a carcass, it's human nature for gamers to be drawn to views that deviate from the norm of what most others think. For some reason we just relish in hearing others' views and persecute them so for a viewpoint that in the grand scheme of things is utterly meaningless. And because I'm a masochistic son of a bitch, I thought I'd share some of my controversial gaming opinions. So let's sit back, relax and listen to what some chump on the internet thinks. Kicking off 2022 too with some healthy negativity. Happy fucking new year. Okay, let's kick this off with some messed up shit. I think console exclusives are not a bad thing and are kind of a necessity in today's gaming industry. I know this is something that annoys a lot of people, having to miss out on things because you didn't invest a hefty sum in a certain system. And I completely get it. I too wake up crying knowing I haven't got the means to play Connect Disneyland Adventures, but I just pick up the pieces of my life and move on. Here's the thing, it mostly boils down to one important point. Healthy competition in the current industry is pretty much vital to ensuring consumers don't get royally fucked. At least not as much as we already are. And console exclusives are the key to driving that competition. We're at a point where consoles are nearly indistinguishable in terms of specs, so what's going to entice people to get your system over the other? Well, how about a game that can only be played on your console? And you better make sure that that game is better than your competitions if you want to justify that your console is worth buying. This then ensures that not the developers in this case, but mainly the console manufacturers and executives have to actually somewhat care about quality and therefore are more focused on putting out better quality games. And then by extension it adds a huge factor in giving each console their own identity and what sets them apart. And while I understand this isn't obviously the case for every single console exclusive with stupid bullshit like timed exclusivity which is literally just corporate bribery, and certain scenarios like Microsoft's acquisition of not only Bethesda but now even Activision, though that is most a very different situation altogether and is worthy of its own separate discussion. But for the most part, I believe that console exclusives, like it or not, are an essential component to maintaining the balance in the modern gaming industry. And I mean, could you even imagine Mario on Xbox? That's just fucked up. But while I'm on about things that I think are necessary for a console, I think backwards compatibility should be more of a focus for console manufacturers or at the very least provide a good alternative for playing retro content. Now I generally consider this an unpopular opinion, mainly because backwards compatibility is normally viewed as a luxury rather than a necessity, which, okay fine, I can see why. Retro gaming is definitely somewhat more niche compared to modern gaming, however there's no denying that it's constantly becoming more popular and companies are very aware of that. We do live in an age where nostalgia sells after all. Now most retro enthusiasts may just say, oh just play it on the old consoles, yeah sure I'll just hook it up here and wow it looks like ass. And yes I am fully aware that there are plenty of options regarding playing on original hardware, I did make a whole damn video on it. But I personally think it's just more convenient and cost effective to be able to play most of our games on as few systems as possible in a modern setup. Microsoft to their credit are currently leading on this front by offering backwards compatibility, albeit with a limited number of games, though that is because they optimise each one to ensure it runs as good as it can on the modern hardware. Okay, fair enough, swings and roundabouts, it's at least far more than Sony can say at the moment with the PS5. Now with PS3 games, I understand
understand as that console had a very complex hardware to run those games, but you honestly can't tell me that it's beyond Sony's capability to have stable PS2 and especially PS1 emulators that the PS5 of all consoles could run. And then we got Nintendo, Christ where do I start? Okay yes with the Switch it's way more understandable why physical media isn't compatible. It's not like I'm sitting here confused with my copy of Wii Music going I'm pissed. But that's okay because as an alternative Nintendo offer you to get fucked. Ask any Nintendo fan they'll tell you this moment is probably up there as one of mankind's biggest lows. Bottom line I stand by this because companies are more than capable of offering backwards compatibility or can at the very least offer a good alternative but instead it seems like they're more interested in leeching off us. And yes, while I could enjoy experiencing games on their original consoles, sometimes... Ugh. Ah oh, yeah, that reminds me, the N64 controller is terrible. Now obviously some people, normally those who grew up with this console, tend to swear by this controller as a good way of playing N64 games. And then on the other hand, you have people who are right. Now of course there's no denying this controller was revolutionary. It introduced the analog stick and was the first to include rumble, albeit via a separate peripheral and oh does it feel like a first draft of something. First off, the layout. Now, I get Nintendo's idea was to have a controller suitable for the new 3D era, but have the option to go back to 2D just in case the idea of Mario with a Z-axis made them piss themselves. However, the way it was implemented makes it a jack of all trades, but a master of none. It's clear by looking at the way the design of future controllers went that this free prong style just wasn't a good way to go. Okay fine, I will give Nintendo this, it was an experimental phase after all, but I'm just getting started. The general feel of everything on here is just wank, this analog stick has arthritis, it's so damn brittle. The face buttons and d-pad aren't great either, and the shoulder buttons make me physically sick. It's just unpleasant to use all round, and because of this, this thing has single-handedly ruined game experiences for me. When I first played through Banjo-Kazooie and Mario 64 for example, I could couldn't even get through them. Using this thing made playing these games an uphill battle and was way more frustrating than it needed to be. But when I played the Xbox Live re-release of Banjo and the 3D All-Stars version of Mario 64 more recently with the 360 controller and the Switch Pro controller respectively, I had an absolute blast and finally got to appreciate these brilliant games and even ended up 100%ing both. This thing was so dog shit it made these games not fun, so yeah. Not a fan. And hey, fuck it, let's kick the N64 while it's down by talking about one of its most poignant titles, Conker's Bad Fur Day, and how I think the remake Conker Live and Reloaded is the superior version. Bad Fur Day is the very definition of a cult classic, so a remake of any kind was always bound to be divisive. However, Live and Reloaded is often cited by many as an example of a bad remake. After playing the original Conker and having a very mixed experience, I wanted to check the remake out and see what all the fuss was about. And my god, I enjoyed it so much more, and frankly the majority of the hate it gets I think is some of the most overblown and petty shit I've ever heard. So when I first played the original Bad Fur Day on the N64, I liked it. I enjoyed the writing and comedy well enough, but my god it is a dopey slog to actually play, and it is a huge flaw that I don't think many people address with the original. The platforming is really heavy, it's incredibly finicky, and when the game goes all third person shooter in the latter chapters, it is some of the worst shooting controls I've ever experienced. And this isn't just down to the controller equivalent of polio, as when I attempted a second playthrough with the much better Horipad Mini, it was still a struggle just because of how awkward it is to control. Even the rare replay version from what I hear also suffers from the same issues despite utilising a more modern controller so it's clearly not a controller issue, it's baked within the game itself. When we get to Live and Reloaded, it completely redeems the gameplay and controls. It's so much more responsive and smooth, and even tweaks certain sections that were utter bullshit and just poorly designed in the original. Bottom line, the game is actually fun to play this time around. However, most qualms with Live and Reloaded seem to be more so in the presentation, mainly the censored swear words. So the original game had some censored swear words, Live and Reloaded censors a few more. Is it necessary? No, absolutely not. But it seems like the vast majority write this remake off completely because of this one sole reason. 
That is fucking ridiculous. Oh no, the funny squirrel game didn't say bumhole. Now some also bring up the look of the game, which yes, does deviate with a bit more of a realistic tint to the cartooniness, and yes, I do agree that the facial animations are a downgrade in the remake. The game still looks great regardless, and much like the original, it pushes its console's power to its limits, like this could easily pass for an early 360 game. And I personally still think it gets the point of the joke across in its presentation. I know some may argue that Conquer is more about the writing and comedy rather than the gameplay, but this is still a game first and foremost, and I think the remake just provides a vastly improved gameplay experience. And I find these improvements to completely outweigh its shortcomings, which even then I think are really overblown for the most part. I honestly think Live and Reloaded has received a seriously unfair bad rep, mainly due to people focusing on such menial flaws, but it will remain the better version of the game to me at least. You know I'm loving bitching about Nintendo, now I know how their fans feel. So let's take one more hefty punch at them with their main man. Mario. Fuck! And how I think the first Mario Galaxy is better than the second. The 3D Mario games are all iconic in their own right, but Mario Galaxy will always hold a special place in my heart. Not only nostalgically, but also simply for being a masterpiece of a game. Even Miyamoto himself went on record saying, bro, this shit slaps. So it then became, as of yet, the only 3D Mario game to get a full-blown sequel. People went nuts for Galaxy 2, singing its praises and citing it as being a vast improvement over the first one. And don't get me wrong, Galaxy 2 is a damn fine snack if there ever was one, but better than the first Galaxy? I disagree. And putting my nostalgia for the first one aside, I think most of it mainly boils down to it lacking a lot of the charm and character of the first game. The first Galaxy was probably the only Mario game where the story was somewhat decent, the stakes felt high and there were some surprisingly touching parts to it. Yeah, this traditionally emotionless and characterless chump actually squeezed some vague emotion out of me for once. The Comet Observatory was so damn enchanting and the galaxies and levels are just so so much more memorable to me. Galaxy 2 still does carry on the great platforming gameplay, but standardises a lot of things with a more basic level selection and hub, and simply not quite capturing the same level of tone and whimsy of the first game. It ultimately feels like just more Galaxy, which yeah, makes sense when you realise it was originally conceived as an expansion, but it just didn't engage me or stick with me like the first one did. It's good old derivative fun, still a great game in its own regard, but the original is just the overall complete package and will always remain the superior one in my mind. And because I can't write a transition for shit, let's clumsily shift on over now to another platforming icon, Crash Bandicoot, which as I'm sure you and my government already know is my favourite game series ever. Though I will happily preach blasphemy when I say that the most recent entry, Crash 4 It's About Time, is the best game in the mainline series. Crash 4 had a lot to live up to, being the first new entry in the series in a long time, and the first to go back to the original format in even longer. Personally, I love this game. It has some flaws, of course, but overall, with its level design and controls, I think it's near 3D linear platforming perfection. But I guess like my views on making Luigi a religion, I'm apparently wrong. I see a lot of divisiveness over Crash 4, and while it's generally considered good, people don't often really put it up there with the level of praise 2 and 3 get. I can understand part of their reasoning, such as the bloated and aggravating completionist criteria, which I find to be down mainly to the inverted level, simply recycling and reheating the existing levels only to serve up sweet sweet eye cancer, as well as the box placements on a few levels being kind of bullshit and a couple little control quirks with the other characters, stuff that is generally unanimous. But then I also see criticism for things that I thought were generally great like the level design, the controls, it's too hard or the levels are too long or it doesn't feel like the original trilogy. Now fine, if that's how they feel then okay, yeah, I agree, it definitely stumbles a bit, but when I stack it up against Crash 2 and 3, I genuinely think it does a lot to improve on those games. I feel like this was a great evolution of the original trilogy's gameplay. It absolutely nailed the platforming that Crash was always best at and expanded upon it while keeping it the focus like a good sequel should. The level design was way more ambitious and the presentation made each level feel entirely unique and full of character. For me, despite its flaws, it still really lived up to a lot of my expectations and as someone who loved the original trilogy and grew 
grew up with those games. I think this was a great sequel and is my confidence favourite in the series. That or I have developed a fucked up case of Stockholm Syndrome. However, let's flip this scenario with another series, the Batman Arkham games, and I'm gonna preemptively add my name to the list, as I proclaim that I think Batman Arkham City is the weakest in the series. So while my stock value plummets from that remark, let me quickly talk about Arkham Asylum. One of my favourite games of all time. The combat system and stealth gameplay is slick and satisfying, the tight focused level design, the thick, eerie gothic atmosphere, and a simple story with great performances from the best damn Joker and a man whose bollocks have dropped so far they're practically dragging on the ground. It's a fantastic game, but apparently all you have to do to make people go ape shit is add infrastructure. People adored the sequel Arkham City, saying it was bigger, better, and even years later with the other two games released, it's often hailed as the best in the series. Though on the other hand, can you really call a game with this shit caked on its box art the best of anything? Okay, so with Arkham City, I still enjoyed the core gameplay. The story, while having some pretty shit characters, at the same time balanced it out with more great Batman villains, plenty of twists and turns, and some great boss fights. I just think everything else sucks. The side missions I find to be tedious, bloated, and boring. The Riddler can fucking do one. And the open world is just an absolute jumbled mess of level design. Arkham City itself is just a clumsily layered maze and hodgepodge of crap that does not flow well at all. I don't know why, but this open world just really kills it a lot for me, and on top of that, I just don't personally click with the atmosphere or tone of City. I guess for me, it just tries to go for being bigger and better for the sake of being bigger and better, and in doing so, forgets quite a lot of the nuances and details that made Asylum so good. With Arkham Knight, I enjoyed it a little bit better than City, though its story was very predictable and being very flawed in a big old Batmobile shaped area of gameplay. And Arkham Origins is actually my second favourite behind Asylum, and a game I think is criminally underrated for reasons that are kinda long to go into here, but I think it achieved quite a lot of what City wanted to do, but with a better execution. I don't think Batman Arkham City is a bad game overall, but if I'm honest, it's easily my least favourite in the series to come back to. Anyway, I'm done bitching about menial shit, I'm about to certify myself as a disgusting gamer once and for all when I proudly proclaim that I prefer playing on consoles to PC. Now I completely get why PC gaming is so popular and why it's generally seen as the superior format of gaming. Games can potentially look and run incredible on PCs, you can have all your games digitally ready to play at a moment's notice, and there's a much vaster and sometimes cheaper library of games available on PC just to mention a few reasons. And I personally enjoy playing on a PC too, especially with games that are specifically designed for PC as their main platform. However, I just prefer being a filthy console peasant for several reasons. Firstly, PC gaming is way more finicky and unpredictable, I could sell about 7 or so kidneys to buy the highest end graphics card or processor, but that still wouldn't guarantee me stability in running a game. There's tons more variables to consider and more elements that tend to have to be tweaked and even if one of these things isn't right or slightly off, it can potentially mess up how a game runs or just not allow it to run at all. Consoles may not be a guaranteed smooth experience either, but they're generally a much more consistent experience even if they're not as technically impressive. Secondly, I'm one of those sick bastards who enjoys collecting physical games. I don't know why, maybe I'm trying to fill an empty void in my life, maybe I'm obsessed with the way Frogger looks on my shelf. Who knows? PC does have games released physically, but let's be honest, the main format for nearly all PC games is digital. Thirdly, I find consoles to normally have the much better exclusives, or at least ones that appeal to me more. And finally, I just find playing on consoles to be a generally more comforting and enjoyable experience. As fucking ridiculous as this sounds, I find that there is this massive charm to playing on consoles. Not to say that playing on PCs is soulless, but I find consoles to have a ton more character to them in every aspect. I mean, you look at this and it just screams of personality, and that personality is virginity, deodorant, and masturbating. And for me personally, grabbing a game off my shelf, opening the case, getting the disc out, popping it in, grabbing a controller, sitting back in front of my TV, and listening to that console boot up and playing a game that's an experience that just can't be beaten. And I do still really enjoy gaming on PCs and recognize that there are many more advantages to playing on them. This here though, this is what gaming is and always has been to me and that's not changing anytime soon.
And those are just some of my unpopular gaming opinions, and at the end of all this, I think there's a valuable lesson to be learned here, and that's that none of this actually fucking matters. When all is said and done, we're talking about playing video games here, for Christ's sake. It's hardly the be all or end all of things. Surprisingly enough, we're all different people, and we all enjoy different things when it comes to gaming, even when it goes against a general consensus. Some people just like Knack, I don't know why that's their fucked up choice, and I just have to accept that. What I'm getting at here is that there's no real need to get annoyed or angry towards those who may not have a similar view on things when it comes to this topic. We can get pissed all we want, but in reality, there's far more important matters in the grander scope of the industry that deserve the attention and anger more. So with that said, I'd encourage all of you to share some of your unpopular gaming opinions and get some discussion going, because when it all comes down to it, who really gives a fuck? Well, my resolution for the new year is certainly going well. I've said plenty of heinous things in the past 20 minutes or so, and I have no intention of stopping my horrific deeds here. Next up, I'm gonna commit murder and buy NFTs. Okay, so the latter may be a bit extreme.